Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I thank God for this time that God has uh, given me to stand here with the Word of God. As a congregation, we have been praying for the past few days. Uh, today is the 20th day of the 21 day prayer meeting. Uh, you know, before that, our sisters prayed for 52 days and many other prayers. I'm thankful to God that as a congregation, God has given us this opportunity to pour our hearts in the presence of God. Who knows if the Lord tarries, I don't know, what is the next opportunity we have to come as a congregation? We all know about COVID, right? COVID 2020 came in and disrupted our lives to such an extent that it stopped prayer services, fellowships, and everything. The world is going through a very different situation. Things are changing very fast. We turn around, look, there is conflicts, there's turmoil, the struggles, the strives. Who knows if the Lord tarries, we will have this kind of opportunity to come together as a congregation. But thank God that God has given us this season to praise God and worship the name of the Lord. May the name of God be glorified. We must remember that even though we come as a congregation to pray, that that is not an excuse for personal prayer time. We should make sure that we have personal prayer time even though we have our congregational prayers. We must thank God that the Spirit of God is prodding us. The Spirit of God is moving in us to come to prayer. And to have the spirit of prayer, it's actually, we all know it is very difficult, right? We can sit and do Bible study for lots of hours, but to sit and pray itself is so difficult, actually. To pray, praying means we had to pour our hearts in the presence of God. The Spirit of God has to move in our hearts and minds. And I thank God that during this past 20 days, 52 days, and throughout this year, different times, God has gave us time to pray in the presence of God. For meditation this evening, let us turn to John chapter 6, verse 35. Gospel of John chapter 6, verse 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. As I was uh, meditating on what is the portion to speak, the one thing that kept resonating in my mind is the different portions is, come to me, come to me. God is calling each and every one of us, come to me. That is the call of God. Come to me, come to me. Here, in this particular verse, Jesus is saying that why should we come to him? Why? Because I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And he that comes to me shall never hunger. And he that, then the next, look at the next one. Not only come to me, but he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Hallelujah. That is such a great consolation in this time when we are living in turmoils and all that kind of situation. Here Jesus says, come to me. He's calling us, come, come, come to me. Yeah, I know there are a lot of things stopping us, but come to me. And But what is, look at the first part. I am the bread of life. I am. When it says I am, what comes to your mind? I am. I am. What comes to your mind when it says I am? When Moses, right, was upon the Mount Horeb, 
seeing the burning bush, Moses asks, when people ask me who I am, what should I say? What did God say? Say that I am who I am. Hallelujah. In Greek, it's I am means ego emi. Ego emi means I am means I am the self-existent one. I am the self-existent one, which means that I don't need anything. I don't depend on anything. The whole universe cannot exist, but I still will exist. I am ego emi. This ego emi, I am saying, I am who? The bread of life. He is the life, children of God. He is our life. He is the bread of life. And he's saying that, I am, Jesus is saying, I am the source of your life. We all know our life is so precious, right? Especially those folks who work in the medical field. And especially last week, Pastor very beautifully narrated how the life comes in us, I guess. And he gave a very good example of how to you know, you know, have the life, how the life and everything. If you remember the conversation, we all know life is very important for us. But here we see that Jesus is saying, I am the source of the life actually. The hunger that you and I have in our spirit, only he can satisfy it. The thirst that you and I have in our spirit, it is only God who can quench that spirit, the, the thirst in our lives. Thank God that God has allowed us to come into his presence this past few days. And that is because we had the hunger for God and we had the Thirst for God. Hallelujah. This chapter 6 is uh, a big chapter. There is 71 verses in this chapter. And as I was going through chapter 6, there are some of the verses or words keep reoccurring in this chapter 6. Uh, bread is mentioned 17 times. The word bread is mentioned in chapter 6, 17 times. The word hunger is mentioned one time. The word eat or meat is mentioned about 20 times. The other word that come, keeps on coming in this chapter, in this chapter is, words, uh, the word is come. It's not on there. The word is come. It is mentioned 13 times. And the word believe, it is mentioned 9 times. So, the word bread is mentioned how many times? 17. And the word hunger is mentioned? 1. What is 17 plus 1? 18, right? And the eat or meat is mentioned how many times? 20 times. So, what is 18 plus 20? 38. 38 times, what is going on? 38 times, this chapter talks about what? Bread. Hunger, eat or meat. So obviously you understand, you kind of get an idea that where is this chapter, why this chapter is talking about eating you know, and uh, hunger and all that kind of stuff. And that leads to the background of this chapter, chapter 6, which we can see in uh, chapter 6, verse 5 to 13, Chapter 6, verse 5 to 13, it is a very familiar story over there. Chapter 6, verse 5 to 13. It says that, I'm not going to go through and read the whole portion. It says that multitudes of people are coming to Jesus. Lots and lots of people are coming to Jesus. Yes, Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing there's a multitude of people, large crowd of people came to Jesus. And Jesus is asking Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And we have heard this particular portion uh, this week, I believe, that when we see Jesus, when people come to Jesus, Jesus is what? Very compassionate God. He looks at the people and he's a God who has compassion towards the people. And because of his compassion, he's asking 
He knew what to do, but he's asking who? Philip. That Philip, what do you think? Where do we can get something to eat for the people? And Philip answered what? Philip answered and said that 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them. So Philip is saying, Philip quickly did a math. Can you imagine? I don't know. Maybe he was doing the math the whole time or he was wondering about it. He says, 200 pence worth is all we can gather. And that is only if we can share a little bit of bread for all these 5,000 people. And then Andrew comes and says what? Here there is a lad who is, how, how, how much? Five loaves of fish, five loaves of bread and two fishes. And he is also saying what? That it is not sufficient. See, Jesus is very compassionate. It doesn't matter, the crowd is there. Jesus is very compassionate. And Jesus is saying that, okay, you have only this much. But what did he say? Make them, verse 10 says, make them sit down. There was much grass Make them sit down. Jesus take, takes the uh, five loaves of bread and the two fishes. And he did, what did he do? He gave thanks and he started passing that bread. And we see that the bread was so much enough that it says that they, afterwards they, calculate, they, they tried to gather up all the bread. How many baskets were left? Twelve baskets were left. See, Jesus knew what is the need of the people there, right? They came to what? They came to listen to Jesus, but the people over there are what? They are hungry. And understanding the need of the people, Jesus is performing a miracle over there. Hallelujah. Jesus is performing a miracle. But here we can see that Jesus multiplied the food and satisfied the tummy of all the people who were hungry over there. And Jesus provided the food. Multitudes followed Jesus wherever he went. Here, Jesus is trying to take care of the physical need of each and every one over there. Children of God, remember that. The Lord who said, I am the bread of life. Is he enough for your physical needs? Yes. In fact, he can do miracles, right? In our daily life. Knowingly or unknowingly, we may not know it. How many things God has done in each and every day of our life that he does miracles for our physical needs in our life, in our, in our situations when we are sick or when in our children's life, in our family needs. Jesus comes and what? Does miracle just like he took the five loaves and two fishes and he did what? He did a miracle. And But the interesting part is that as we read this chapter here, the people are following Jesus for what? For bread. People are following Jesus for bread. And Jesus, who is the bread of life, is trying to shake them here. But anyway, let me go forward. You know what? This, ha this miracle happened, as you go for read the chapter, this miracle happened. And Jesus departed from the place, and Jesus then goes to a place called Capernaum, actually. Jesus goes to Capernaum, and this crowd is wondering, where did Jesus go? So they search for him, search for him, and they see, verse 25, And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, where, when did you come here? Rabbi, when camest thou either? Okay, those who know the word rabbi is also called Rabuni, actually, right? Mary called Jesus what? Rabuni. But here, we can see the word is called rabbi, but just, that's just a side distraction. Anyway, the people are coming to Jesus and saying what? Ra rabbi, where were you? I know, in fact, it says that they, looked, they went and looked at the place where Jesus did the miracle. He was not there. They looked for the boat. They were, he was not there. Finally, they found, come to find out he went to Capernaum. So these people are running around and seeking Jesus. And they came to where? Capernaum. And Jesus, when they came to Capernaum over there, in 26th verse, Jesus answered them and said, uh, when, when people ask, where did you go? When did you come here? Jesus is saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me 
not because you saw the miracles, but you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Can you imagine that? People are running after Jesus for what? The bread of this physical need. We are all like that, right? Especially in the land of the United States of America, right? Morning till evening, 6 o'clock comes, we're heading up to the car, garage, should go to work, come back. We are all what? We are running for our physical needs. And Jesus is saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me, not because you saw the miracles. Why did Jesus say that? Not because you saw the miracles. How does miracles happen? What is the miracle? When, how can, can a man do miracle? No. Mirac when miracles happen, it is from God. The unfortunate thing is that the people who are following Jesus are not able to see what? The miracle, the, the, what is beyond the miracle, that there is something more beyond the miracle here actually. And Jesus, the discerner of the hearts, said to people, you're coming to me because of people, and people are only interested in satisfying their physical tummies actually. Jesus is saying, but I want to satisfy your tummies. It is true, we all want to take care of our Physical needs, right? We are in a body, right? We are in a body. We want to take care of our needs. Jesus never said that, don't go to work. Nobody take that, actually, right? Jesus said that, you know, uh, you, know uh, seek, you seek me because you saw the miracles and you did the life. But Jesus is not saying that, hey, don't go to work or anything like that. No, that's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I want to satisfy your physical needs, but more than that, I want to meet the needs of your spiritual hunger and thirst. Hallelujah. Jesus is turning, Jesus is trying to turn the attention of the people, what? From the realm of the physical hunger and from the realm of the physical thirst to what? The spiritual, the need of the spirit and need of the, uh, the thirst of the spirit actually. And that is why verse 27 Jesus says, labor not for the meat which perishes, but for the meat which endureth to everlasting life. Hallelujah. Jesus is advising the people, the crowd of people over there that do not, I want to say, you work, but when you work, your priority should be what? To work for the food that does not Perish. See, this is where Jesus, it's interesting that when Jesus talks to people, he carries one-on-one -on -one communication. He carries one-on-one. -on -one. He took the need of the people. What was the need of the people there? They were looking for bread, right? They took the need of the people, which was the bread. They under, he understood the logic of the people that Jesus was, uh, Jesus knew that the people are thinking about bread, bread, and he takes that and he says that the very bread that you are looking for is who? Verse 35. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. So he takes them from the physical realm, the physical bread, and then he says what? I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. And he that believes on me shall never hunger. Thirst. Hallelujah. I thank and praise God that this Jesus, that who we have found in various times in past of life, that he comes to us. Jesus is coming and saying that, come to me, come to me. I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life here. I want to go to verse 44. Verse 44, uh, chapter 6, verse 44. It says, no man can come to me except the Father who sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Jesus is saying, no man can come to me except the Father who sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. I'm going to paraphrase this verse here. If any person wants to come to Jesus, it is possible only when the Father or the heaven draw that person to Jesus. Hallelujah. At a first glance, it seems that 
We must first go to the Father and then go to Jesus. No, that's not what it means. Let's look into it. Here Jesus is telling, talking to a Jewish audience. Jesus is talking to a Jewish audience who calls God what? God as the Father. Even Jesus, in his humanity, while he was on this earth, as he prays, he says, Abba, Father, to the God. So, for Jewish people, Father means what? God in heaven, actually. So Jesus is telling the Jewish audience, you know that the person you call as a father, and I as the father, he is the one who sent me here. Jesus is trying to make a point here that the person you are calling as father, that person is the one who sent me into this earth. And audience is shocked. Because Jesus is saying, I came from God. Audience is shocked because Jesus is saying that Jesus is God. You can see the reaction there. People are murmuring that, that they're, Jesus is saying that I came. But that is why he says that I came. Father sent me. Which means that Jesus is trying to say that I came from where? Heaven. This is a very important aspect that some of the Jewish people or the Jewish people don't know. Uh, that is a verse 40, 42. They even say that, are you not, verse 42, are you not the son of Joseph and Mary? Are you not the son of Joseph and Mary? And people, uh, Jewish people are not able to understand that Jesus is from God. Jesus is clarifying his identity over there. Jesus is stating his identity. Jesus is trying to prove his Deity in that place. He's cheering his deity, but the people are missing the truth. And the audience over there is ignorant of the fact that the Father and Jesus work in unison with the Spirit of God. The Father and the Son always what? Work in unison with the Holy Spirit, actually. The audience is ignorant of the fact that Jesus is co-equal with God. In fact, throughout this gospel, John is continuously belaboring the point that the fact that Jesus is sent from God and Jesus is God. Jesus Christ in his high priestly prayer. Jesus Christ in his high priestly prayer, John chapter 17, verse 8. Before crucifixion, Jesus is praying to the Father and says, Father, these disciples that you gave me, they know that I came from God. And they believe it. That was one of the biggest missions of Jesus while he was on this earth. That the people who he is wanting to make the disciples have to believe that what? Jesus came from God. And not only that, they have to believe in him. Hallelujah. It is one of the mysteries to this world that Jesus came from heaven. Even today, right? Even today, it is a mystery that Jesus came from heaven. People count Jesus as a teacher. People count Jesus as some prophet, as, as a miracle worker. But what is Jesus? Jesus is a God. Jesus is God who came from Heaven. Millions and millions of people cannot grapple with this fact. In fact, even today, our Jewish brethren have a very hard time trying to understand this fact. How much should we thank God, we who are sitting here, that our inner eyes are opened? Our inner eyes are opened to understand this fact that Jesus came from God. Jesus came from God. We should be thankful because millions of people, this time I visited in India, even Pentecostal pastors are saying that people are, are becoming atheists. Even people, a lot of people are becoming atheists actually. People don't know that Jesus is God. Born in a Christian family. People do not know Jesus is God. But thank God. Over the years, at different times, different occasions, Jesus opened our inner hearts and come to the knowledge and the fact of the saving grace 
of Jesus Christ. And he extended his mercy and his grace upon our lives. A revival broke out in America about 100 years ago. And that revival in America and in Europe, and what happened? It came to India, pockets of India here and there, the revival, right? And I personally believe that that revival helped this group of people sitting here to come to the knowledge that Jesus is God. Hallelujah. Unless the Spirit of God moves, we cannot come to the fact that Jesus is God. Right? That is why in another portion, Jesus says, it is not flesh and blood that revealed it to you. It is Father in heaven who revealed that Jesus is who? God. It is the Father in heaven that revealed that Jesus is God. It is not flesh and hell, uh, blood, but Father in heaven revealed that. So when Jesus is saying here that Father sent me, or he came down from heaven, he's saying to this audience, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit together are working to draw the people to God. Are working together to draw the people to God. The triune God is constantly in the, in the work, constantly working in every human being's life to bring us closer to Him. Can you do, you, do you or do any one of us, if we are not heard the voice of God here, God is calling. God is calling. Hallelujah. Are you refusing the voice of God or are you very closely paying attention to that beautiful voice of God? Come to me. Come to me. God is calling. Now let us go back to that verse 44 and see that verse draw. The word draw, the root word draw is halko in Greek. The root word draw is halko which means the literally meaning or the figurative meaning of the word halko is, you would be, uh, when you hear about it, you might be shocked. It says to drag. Drag. The Greek word that is used for drawing is halko, which means to drag. God is the one who draws each and every one to salvation. Hallelujah. There is no doubt we need to respond when God is drawing us. There is no question we need to respond when God is calling us. Drawing means God is wooing us. God is wooing us. God is, God is attracting us. He's making all the force on his side that we can come to him. Every effort God is making that we can come to Jesus. God is drawing us also means he's compelling us to come to him. When I say these things, I know that there is a big notion out there. But here God is what? Drawing us. You see this, where else do you see this picture of God drawing? In the Old Testament. God is drawing. Alluring. Where does you see that? In the book of Hosea. Marubumi poi. Marubumi poi. Avrale. I went into, God is telling about people of Israel that I am alluring the people of Israel. We have heard many messages here. I'm alluring. I'm trying to bring you. Children of God. This God who said, I am the bread of life. He's a self-existent God. He doesn't need any one of us. 
He can do everything without us. In fact, when the universe was created, there was only three people there. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There was nothing, absolutely nothing there. But he is what? He is alluring us. He is drawing us. He's trying to attract us. He's trying to bring us to his presence. God is calling us. How many of you this year, 2023 is going to pass by. How many times God came to you and tried to talk to you? And what was your, your response? As I'm saying this, what was my response? What was my response? He's... He's doing everything. He has provided us what we needed. Everything for our physical needs. Right? And not only that, he has provided things that are needed much more. Everything. But have we responded to God? Why does God want us to draw to him? Or why, does, why is God wanting us to come closer to him? Why does God keep on calling us? Before salvation, our mind was darkened and our hearts were hardened. By nature, we are sinful. Our human nature is sinful. Our fleshly nature is sinful. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 kind of puts a very good picture. He says that we were dead in trespasses and sins. We were dead in trespasses and sins. But what did God do? He quickened us. He did quicken us. It is the work of God. It is the work of God. The touch of God. God was coming after us again and again and again. And he wanted us. And he wanted us. So that's why we, we by ourselves could not come to God. Our minds were dark. Our hearts were hardened. But God, because of his love, right? Because of his love, he came to us and quickened each and every one over here. Hallelujah. Why is God wanting to, us to come closer to him? Why is he calling us? He knows our deadness. He knows our deadness. There are de several areas in our life. We are dead many times, right? We are not. God wants to come and touch us whenever we are dead. And that is one of the reasons. And so we can see God is working. God is drawing so that we can be quickened. Why does God want us to draw to him? Why is God wanting us to come closer to him? Why does God keep us calling us? Because He loves us. He loves us. It is He who first loved us. Because of the love of God, we can see that He's extending the mercy. Mercy and grace, I, have the, I think, are the byproducts of love. Out of the love, He extends His mercy. Out of the love, He extends His Grace. I know my time is almost up here. So one point I want to make is that when God is calling us, loving us, He is compelling us, what is our response? Are, you, are we refusing God? I'm going to just read the verse here. I have Proverbs 124. I have called and you refused. I stretched out my hand and no man regarded you. You have set my, all my counsel to naught and would none of my reproof. This is God is calling. God is calling. And, but God wants to come and touch us. He is stretching his hand and he wants to uh, come and touch us. And that is what, if there is any areas in our life that is, there is deadness. If there is any areas in our life that God, you think that, we need a touch of God. God is here, right? As we are standing here at the 20th day of the fasting prayer, this good Lord wants to come and touch us. Hallelujah. 
you might be burdened with some kind of things burden your heart. But this God is a loving God. He's drawing us. He's saying, son, come to me. Daughter, come to me. I have great plans for you. I have great things for you. And that's what God is saying. We might be shackled by heavy burden. Beneath the load of guilt and shame, the hand of Jesus can touch us and then we'll no longer be the same. And as you know, that is a line from the chorus. We all know. I probably tried to sing it. It's been a long time I sang the song. But if you know, I will sing that and I'll sit down. It's shackled by a heavy burden neath the load of guilt and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me and no longer the same. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And all the joy then. Something happened. And now I know he took me and made me whole. He touched me, oh, he touched me, and all oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened. And oh, I know he touched me and made me whole. One more time, that chorus. Oh, he touched me. And all the joy that floods my soul. Something happen and no he touched me and made me whole hallelujah let god touch us and let god bless us with his words thank you